True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Now, the important thing that I want to say, and I've said since the beginning, is we want to find my Trace Richardson. That's all we want to do. We want to find her. We look for her every day. Now, this is a, don't forget, the Los Angeles Police Department is involved in this as well. It is their investigation, in fact, because she, her residence is Los Angeles. But that's a, a kind of a technical thing because everybody's looking for. The Los Angeles Police Department has two detectives that are just, they're assigned to this case. This is what they're doing. We offered her a place to stay the night. She could have stayed in the lobby. She could have stayed in her own individual cell with a bed. We offered her that uh, that avenue, uh, and she wouldn't have been locked in. She could have left if she wanted to. Uh, she chose not to do any of that. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Maitrice Richardson was released from the Lost Hills Sheriff's Department in Malibu, California, in the middle of the night, without her phone, any money, or transportation. And this happened on September 17, 2009. She had been arrested hours earlier after behaving strangely at an upscale restaurant. She was unable to pay her dinner bill, and the restaurant staff were concerned that she was mentally unstable or intoxicated. Once in police custody, Maitrice's mother was contacted, and she was assured that they would be keeping Maitrice overnight. Her mother could pick her up in the morning. But by morning, Maitrice had been released, and her whereabouts were unknown. No one knew why Maitrice had driven about 40 miles from her home to the Oceanside Malibu neighborhood where the restaurant was. She had made some strange Facebook posts, and she demonstrated some unusual behavior that day. When she was released after midnight, she was in an area that she didn't know at all without any way to contact her family. Her car had been impounded, so she was unable to get it. It was quite far away. Maitrice's family believed that she could have been having a mental health crisis, so her release was both negligent and very dangerous. And as time passed and Maitrice was not found, her family began to feel ignored and even deceived by the sheriff's office and the LAPD. Join us at The Quiet End today for the story of a disoriented, young, African-American woman who was left to fend for herself in the dead of night in the rugged terrain of the Santa Monica Mountains, and was never seen or heard from again. What happened to Maitrice Richardson? The gaps and omissions in the Sheriff's Department's handling of her case, as well as her family's discoveries and concerns, really welcome further investigation into the events of her disappearance. So that's what we're going to do today. It will be an interesting discussion. It will. So, And the nice thing, kind of, was that this is a California case, Southern California, Los Angeles area, and I just had a beer from there. Okay, well, that works out. So this is a beer called Ticket to Dankville, brewed at the Imperial Western Beer Company in downtown L.A. Uh, We... We're fortunate enough to sit down one afternoon while we were visiting there, and we had some beer with the uh, brewer at Imperial Western and his wife, delightful couple. So this is a nice IPA. Uh, It's a clear gold color, small white head, not much in the way of lace, beautiful citrus and pine aroma, taste of grapefruit, grapefruit rind, kind of bitter, and pine shows up late. It's hoppy. And it's dank. Great (laughs) beer. All right, let's open it up. Okay. Okay, Dickie, grab your beer and follow me to the quiet end. Now, this is a case with quite a bit of coverage, so I'm hoping we can add a little bit of thought into it and maybe just get some discussion going. Well, we'll try. Okay. So Maitrice hadn't been acting like herself in the days leading up to her disappearance. She had been sending nonsensical texts to family and friends and had been leaving confusing posts on social media. 
And this was kind of an abrupt change in her. Within days, yeah. It wasn't like a slow decline or anything like that. And it's suddenly things started looking not right. Yeah, which would go along with manic depression. Also, she was just had had a breakup with a girlfriend. So that could have kind of set it off, life events like that. Sure. Yeah. And you, you had read, I think, that there were some indications that she suffered from bipolar disorder. Yes. Although we couldn't find anything definite that substantiated that. No, I couldn't find a confirmation by her family of a specific psychiatric diagnosis, but it was mentioned. Yes. And definitely considered, you know, by looking at her writings and her behavior on that day, at least. Oh, absolutely. And we don't have any indication that she was on any medication. No. Nope. Anyway, so her tragic story began on a September evening in 2009. My trees drove about 40 miles to a Malibu restaurant called Jeffrey's in her Honda Civic. And no one knows why. I mean, she didn't frequent Malibu. Uh, didn't do a lot of stuff around there. So there wasn't any particular reason to well, be in Malibu. Well, I guess she had mentioned to see the beach. Also, there was a college down there that she was interested in, Pepperdine. So she could have been driving by there. Sure. But, but it was a ways from home. Maybe not in the evening, though. Right, maybe not. Now, reports are that Nitrice pulled up to the valet at Jeffrey's. And as the valet was parking another car, he saw that Nitrice had climbed into his own personal car and was kind of rummaging around in it. Right, and it was still daylight. She didn't arrive there very late. When the valet confronted her, Maitrice told him that she had come to avenge Michael Jackson's murder. Now, Michael Jackson had just died that June, so it was still a really big story at the time, and it might have been on her mind. Yeah, but that's still a little bit of a weird thing to say. Oh, it's absolutely a weird thing to say. Absolutely. I'm just saying that might be why he particularly came to mind, because that was a recent event. But she did go inside the restaurant and ordered a steak and a cocktail. There was a group of seven diners sitting at a table near her, and they seemed to be having a good time. So she joined them, which was a little strange, and she was acting bizarrely and saying odd things, but she wasn't threatening or scary or anything, so they were polite to her and they chatted with her. They didn't seem very bothered. I think actually the waiter had asked them if it was okay, if she was bothering them, and they said, no, it's fine. Yeah, but then the party of seven left, and Maitrice was left with her dinner bill of $89, and she didn't have the money to pay for it. And it seemed to have been under the impression that one of the other people that she was sitting with was going to pay. So according to witnesses at the restaurant, Maitrice told the group that she was from Mars when she first sat down, and other people described her as manic. So when the restaurant didn't want to eat the bill, they ended up calling the police. Yeah, but it wasn't just that, because people were offering to pay it for her. So I think at least part of it was a concern for her going off in a car with that kind of weird behavior going on. Well, so they did the right thing? I think so. Deputies from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department arrived, and they questioned my trees, and they gave her a field sobriety test, which she passed. When they searched her car they found a small amount of marijuana. So she was placed under arrest and taken to the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station. Her car was impounded miles away. A deputy spoke with Maitrice's mother, Latisse, and explained to her that Maitrice would be held held until the following morning. So Latisse made plans to pick her up in the morning. Unfortunately, though, Maitrice was released at 12.28 a.m., and she disappeared into the night. Over the next year, a rift developed between Maitrice's family and the sheriff's department. Why was she allowed to walk off in the middle of the night with only her driver's license and her car keys? And why wasn't she given a ride to her car, at least, because it was nearly 15 miles away? These questions and others would come up as they were searching and further investigation. These questions and others would come up as there was further investigation into what happened that night, and as it was brought to the attention of the media and the public. What happened to Maitrice after she left the sheriff's station? Did someone pick her up? Was she so confused that she wandered into the woods and died? 
or did the sheriff's office play a direct role in her disappearance? Yeah, that's certainly a little more sinister with that one. That is, and it's something we'll discuss because it is worth considering, I believe. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, though, is that the sheriff's department was a little bit derelict in their duties to Maitrice. Sure, but I'd say more than a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Well. I'd say there's at least some really strong negligence here, and they do have a lot of culpability. Not according to them. So Maitrice Levon Richardson was born in 1985 to her mother, Latisse, and her father, Michael Richardson. Latisse and Michael dated in their junior year of high school, and then Latisse found out she was pregnant in the beginning of her senior year. She was focused on providing a better life for her daughter than she herself had had. Latisse worked hard to achieve good grades, and she was helped out greatly by her grandmother, Mildred, who was more like a mother to Latisse than a grandmother. So after Maitrice was born, Mildred cared for her so that Latisse and Michael could work full-time. Michael was frustrated by his low-paying job, and he got into trouble. He had a history of selling some marijuana, and he quite easily went back to that. And then his crimes escalated, and by the time Maitrice was four, Michael was charged with multiple felonies. He was sentenced to eight years in state prison, and he would end up serving four years. So are these all drug-related crimes that he was sentenced for, when you say multiple felonies? Well, it depends how liberal you are with related Yes, they all happened in relation to selling drugs. Okay. Yeah. But by the time Michael was out of prison, Latisse was in a new relationship. And she had met and fallen in love with a man named Larry Sutton. So they married, and Larry ended up being a good stepfather to my trees. Now, during this time, there were growing tensions between the police and the Los Angeles African-American community. Everyone knows the incident where Rodney King was beaten by the police. And in 1992, the four police officers were charged with using excessive force. Three were acquitted, and the jury deadlocked on the fourth. And after that, the L.A. riots began, which lasted for six days. Sixty-three people were killed, and over 2,000 were injured. The Los Angeles Police Department has a long history of corruption and racism. In the 70s, deputies formed gangs within their stations, They had each developed their own code of conduct, which included illegal activity. And in the 1980s, memberships in the gangs grew as the communities became more populated with black and Latino immigrant residents. One group called themselves the Vikings, and a judge would later define them as a neo-Nazi white supremacist gang. When Lee Baca took over as sheriff in 1998, he seemed oblivious to this problem. He knew about the gangs, but he told the LA Times that he was worried that a ban in membership would be unconstitutional. So his only action was to ask officers not to join. So this was a frightening environment for a person of color to live and raise a family. Yeah, so Latisse and Larry decided that Maitrice would be safer if they moved to the San Gabriel Valley region. So in 1993, they got a home in the suburb of Covina located about 22 miles east of downtown Los Angeles. The Covina population was 98% white. Now, compared to L.A., life in Covina was like living in a small town. Yeah, the family really thrived in Covina. Latisse opened a legal services business, and Maitrice excelled in her studies. Latisse encouraged Maitrice to work hard, telling her that she could achieve anything, but only if she gave it 100%. So she was kind of tough on her, too. Maitrice was expected to be responsible and hardworking, so she did well academically, but she was also very athletic. She loved dance and was active on the high school cheerleading squad. According to friends and family, Maitrice had a natural talent and charisma, so she drew a lot of positive attention from a lot of people. Maitrice became more introspective as she reached adulthood. Although she was physically fit, She preferred to stay home and read rather than participate in outdoor activities. She didn't like to hike or camp or or do anything where she could get dirty. She'd rather stay inside watching TV, dancing, or doing crossword puzzles. Didn't enjoy being outdoors. No, so this is important just to say that she's not the type of person who's going to go off on a long hike on purpose. Right. Right. Back when she got her driver's license, she actually vowed to her family that she was going to walk as little as possible. 
Maitrese's Aunt Lauren would say that Maitrese was a princess. So these descriptions of her make her disappearance even more difficult to explain if you're going to try and say it was accidental. Well, yeah, but then you got to take into account her kind of altered mental state. Exactly. So you can't really base her behavior on her usual behavior. Right. Which makes it more difficult, yeah. But as she reached adulthood, Maitrese became really fascinated with psychology, and that is what she studied in college. A lot of this probably related to her really introspective nature. While attending college, Maitrese came out to her family as a lesbian, and she'd been really nervous about it, worrying that her family would reject her. But they ended up being all very accepting. She was given complete love and acceptance, which was a great relief to her, and she seemed really happy. Like that was a a load off, you know? Well, I'm sure it was. Took a lot of stress off of her to not have to feel like you have to hide that, which I can't imagine how tough that is. But Maitrese attended Cal State Fullerton, good college, after she graduated from high school, and she'd graduated with honors. The campus is about 23 miles south of Covina. In the L.A. traffic, this was easily a one-hour drive. So Maitrese decided to move in with her great-grandmother, Mildred, who lived in L.A. near this campus. Mildred lived alone anyway, and she was 90 or 91, so she really welcomed the company. So they were helping each other out, really. Mutually beneficial. Definitely beneficial for both. Yes. But as you can imagine, Latisse was very proud of her daughter, who was the first family member to attend college. Maitrese took a job at the Santa Fe Springs Shipping Company, and she began dating and fell in love with the owner's daughter, Tessa. Maitrese stood out at the school, becoming friendly with the psychology professors in particular. She decided that she wanted to be a psychologist, and she embraced her sexuality. She even participated in the Long Beach Lesbian and Gay Pride Parade. So things seemed to be going splendidly. So far, yeah. right? Yes. So Maitrese graduated from Cal State Fullerton in 2008 and started looking at grad schools. She took a job dancing at a gay and lesbian nightclub in Long Beach. And she wasn't an exotic dancer or a stripper, but she danced on a small stage as a go-go dancer. And her stage name was Hazel. Maitrese's father, Michael, biologic father, he disapproved. He was an opinionated man. But Maitrese was really having a lot of fun with that job. And she began looking into modeling jobs because she was really beautiful. She began going to job interviews, but many of the people she met with were sketchy. She and Tessa broke up. Then Maitrese became involved with another woman named Vanessa. But there was a lot of tension in that relationship that got worse because Vanessa wasn't single. So Vanessa eventually broke up with Maitrese. And after the breakup, friends and family were really worried about her. At one point, after receiving some odd texts, Latisse texted her daughter asking her if she was okay and got a really strange response. Maitrese wrote back to her, I'm writing a book because you told me I could be anything I wanted. You told me I was Miss America. You told me I was America's next top model. Now do you know what I want to be when I grow up? Miss Mother Nature. Because Miss America is a fake-ass joke along with everything else we see. So I'm trying to find my way to Michelle Obama to see if she will talk to Mr. Obama about creating my position within the White House. So if I get this from my daughter, this text, I'm taking her to see a doctor. Yeah, I would agree that Latisse really didn't respond aggressively enough for my taste. I mean, this, this is really worrisome. It is. I mean... It really is strange, and I think you'd want to see her in person immediately. Yes. So I'm not sure what was going on at that point, but it did alarm Latisse. She didn't think that was normal. Yeah, no, she was worried about it. Yeah, because she had been becoming less social as far as getting together with people or making calls. But at the same time, she had begun posting more than ever on social media. Between 8.26 a.m. and 1.24 p.m. on September 16, 2009, Maitrese left 66 rambling, bizarre posts on her Facebook page. According to a co-worker, Maitrese did show up for work that morning at the shipping company and seemed to be in a great mood. But that goes along with mania. Yeah. Yeah. If you're in a manic episode, you're up. 
you're in a great mood. But Maitrice never returned from her lunch break, and she didn't tell anyone where she was going, and she didn't say that she wouldn't be returning, so that was concerning. She just took off for lunch and didn't come back. Right. Out of character. Yes, for sure. So September 16th was a Wednesday, and this was the day Maitrice normally had dinner with her great-grandma. But for some reason, Maitrice decided to skip the dinner, and she made that 40-mile drive to Malibu, driving along the scenic North Pacific Highway. Mildred would say that Maitrice seemed fine, but she wasn't concerned. Yeah, but why was Maitrice driving to Malibu? Had she wanted to go to the beach? I don't know. But she'd also told some family that she was considering applying to grad school at Pepperdine. And that's located at the corner of Malibu Canyon and the Pacific Coast Highway. So she didn't have an appointment to visit there, but she could have been driving by to have a look at the campus, which was just gorgeous. And you really can't beat the view. No, you can't. So Maitrice had left her great-grandmother's house at about 5 o'clock. Now, sometime between 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock, Maitrice's Aunt Lauren noticed something very odd outside of her home. Maitrice's business cards were strewn all over Lauren's lawn, front steps, and porch, so she must have stopped by there at some time during that day. And also, Maitrice had left a handwritten note under the windshield wiper of Lauren's husband's car. There was a statement, I, Uncle Johnny, Jimmy, along with the smiley face and the message, Black Women Scorn, on the right-hand margin of the paper. Lauren looked at that couldn't make any sense at all of it. Now here's another instance where I would be very alarmed. Yeah, I'd be trying to call my trees, or I'd be trying to call her mom. Yeah, because to me this is more concerning than the text to her mother because it doesn't make any sense at all. And because things are strewn about in the front porch, that would make me very nervous. Exactly. Yeah. So Maitrice was in Malibu by 7 p.m., we know that. She watched the sunset and began driving until she saw Jeffries. And that's what we would imagine because that was how the timing was. Jeffries was a very upscale restaurant with stunning views. I mean, if you look online, it's unbelievable. Maitrice had never been there before, and she really wasn't familiar with Malibu at all. But the restaurant exclusively had valet parking, so when she pulled up there, she was greeted by a valet. He said he was parking another car, but he'd be right back to park hers. And Maitrice agreed. But as soon as he drove away, she got out of her car and got into his car, which was parked nearby with its door open. And the valet came back and asked her what she was doing in his car. Maitrice answered, it's subliminal. Then she added, I'm here to avenge the death of Michael Jackson, as she shuffled through his CDs in his car. Now, I guess he had the door open because maybe between cars he sat there and listened to music or something in his car. Yeah, something. Something like that. But it's subliminal. And then back to Michael Jackson. I don't know. Yeah, well. It's very concerning. And I think the valet thought there's something weird here. Yeah, and she finally did give the valet her keys and then asked, is Vanessa here? And the valet didn't know who Vanessa was. But then Maitrice warned him to watch out for the woman with tattooed arms. Yeah, now remember, Vanessa's the name of the girlfriend who recently broke up with her. Right. So Maitrice asked for a table for one. She was wearing a Bob Marley t-shirt with a long sleeve t-shirt underneath, some jeans, and a pink alligator belt. She was also wearing Vans sneakers and a Rastafarian hat. So her black locks were just flowing from underneath that hat. So she looked pretty cool but she didn't really fit in with the conservatively dressed diners at that restaurant. So Maitrice ordered a $24 Ocean Breeze cocktail and a $65 Kobe steak. And while waiting for her steak, she invited herself to join the table of seven who appeared to be having a good time next to her. She sat down and made a series of bizarre statements, talking about astrology and saying she was from Mars and her mother was from Earth. When her steak showed up, she returned to our table She returned to her table to eat, then she returned back to the group. And after chatting with them for several minutes, they paid their bill and got up to leave. Maitrice told them that she was going to Hawaii, but she would call them when she got there. Then she began to follow them out of the door. But she was stopped by the restaurant manager who told her she hadn't paid her bill. 
Maitrice didn't seem very bothered. She explained that the other party had paid her bill, but the manager said no, they hadn't. When asked how she planned to pay, Maitrice said, Well, I'm busted. What are we going to do? So Maitrice spoke with the manager for several minutes, and she was still behaving really oddly. Some other patrons offered to pay her bill for her, apparently, but the manager was concerned about her behavior and really didn't feel like it was a safe decision to let her drive away. He was worried that she was on drugs or drunk or having some kind of mental breakdown. But according to witnesses, Maitrice didn't seem bothered about the situation and was actually making some jokes. But again, that would go along with her being in a manic state. Certainly would. And a lot of her statements just weren't making any sense. So they were concerned, and I think it was definitely the right thing to do. Call the authorities. Which they did. The hostess called 911. And she explained to the dispatcher that the woman was behaving oddly, and they were worried that she might be drunk or on drugs. Maitrice had said she had no parents, just a great-grandmother. So the restaurant called Mildred, who offered to pay over the phone by credit card. The restaurant, however, wouldn't accept a payment over the phone unless her signature could be faxed to them. And Mildred didn't have a fax machine, and she wasn't going to be able to drive out to the restaurant. She's 91 years old, after all. Yeah, that's a lot to ask of her. Isn't it? But I bet she felt some guilt afterwards, which is a shame. So about 9 p.m., three deputies arrived at Jeffrey's. Frank Brower, John McKay, and Armando Luaro. They escorted Maitrice outside after she explained that her wallet was in the car. And they said they searched her vehicle, which was a mess of papers and lots of trash in the car, but they didn't find her wallet. They did find her driver's license and that small amount of marijuana. There was also an alcohol bottle in the car that was nearly empty, but she passed a field sobriety test. And she denied being on any medication or having any mental illness. The manager told the deputies that he wanted to press charges against her. So she was taken to the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station about 15 miles from the restaurant. Her car was impounded elsewhere over 14 miles away from that station. So she's out in the middle of nowhere, basically. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Especially if you don't know the area. Right. So around the time that Matrice was being taken into custody, her mother called the Lost Hills Station. As Mildred, great-grandma, had called Latisse after speaking with the restaurant staff. And when Latisse called, she spoke to a deputy at the Lost Hills station. According to Latisse, she explained that her 10-year-old daughter was at home, sleeping, so if Maitrice was not going to be released that night, she would wait until morning to pick her up. She said that the only way she would come and pick her up that night was if she was getting released before morning. She said that Maitrice was not familiar with the area that she was in, and she would hate to wake up to a morning report saying a lost girl had her head chopped off. Yeah, now that's a quote, which is kind of... Kind of prophetic, isn't it? A little bit, yeah. Latisse told the deputy that she felt safe having Matrice in police custody. She was actually kind of relieved to have her someplace where she would be watched. And the deputy assured her that Matrice would not be released before morning. So I guess mom's sufficiently worried about her behavior that it's it's good that she's going to stay in custody. I mean, you make a good point there. I think she was very concerned about her daughter. And I think she was relieved that Maitreese wasn't just out and about on her own. Right. She knew she was somewhere safe overnight, supposedly. Supposedly. And then mom could go get her in the morning. Yeah. And I guess Michael, the biological father, had a very different opinion on that, of course, Well, not of course, but it's not surprising that he was not fond of the police, didn't trust them, and he didn't think leaving his daughter with the police was a safe place to leave her. And he he turned out to be right, unfortunately. But I guess he really gave Latisse a hard time about that, and she had to deal with a lot of guilt. Not that she wouldn't already be feeling it as a mother, but he put more and more guilt on her that she had to bear. when When Matrice arrived at the station, she was put into a cell and charged with possession of marijuana and defrauding an innkeeper. So for an unknown reason, though, the the deputy didn't write anything on the arrest report about her odd behavior. Now, it's been speculated that this was intentional because it would save him from doing extra paperwork. Or alternatively, 
he didn't think she was behaving strangely, although pretty much everyone else who'd come in contact with her said she had been acting strangely. Well, yeah, and I would wonder if maybe it was a little of both. Like, oh, she's not behaving that strangely. And I don't want to go through all this paperwork and having to do, you know, the mental health stuff, which is totally lazy and uncalled for. But I can see that happening. So if Maitrice had been noted to be possibly unstable, she would have been held under closer observation or even been given a 72-hour psychiatric evaluation. But neither of these were done. For Maitrice's family and many other people, the failure of the officers to make note of and handle her signs of mental instability were the largest contributing factor to her disappearance that night. Now, according to the sheriff's logbook, Maitrice made four calls that night. Now, the payphone was out of order, so Maitrice made her calls from a desk phone that didn't record calls. None of her calls were made to her mother because she could only remember Mildred's phone number. So deputies stated that they overheard her talking on the phone. But Mildred would say that she did not speak to Maitrice at all after the call from the restaurant. So it's unknown if Maitrice actually spoke to somebody, or maybe she's just talking to herself. That's very possible. It is. But Latisse was staying home, planning to drive to the station in the morning. Because of Maitrice's strange behavior the last few days, Latisse said that it felt good to have her daughter somewhere safe where she would be supervised overnight. Then at 5.20 a.m. on Thursday, September 17th, Latisse called the Lost Hills station back. Jailer Sharon Cummings answered this call, and Latisse wanted to know how much it was going to cost to bail her daughter out of jail. She was told that Maitrice had been released overnight and was pretty upset about it, as you can imagine. Well, no kidding. She was shocked to hear this. She asked why her daughter had been released because she was told the night before that they would keep her until the morning. Yeah, and according to Steve Whitmore, who was the sheriff department's spokesperson, because Maitrice had no previous record and her charges weren't enough to hold her, it was against the sheriff's department policy to keep her overnight. So Whitmore said that she was offered to stay in a cell or in the lobby, but she declined. And according to Whitmore... My tree showed no signs of mental illness or intoxication. She was fine, and she's an adult, so we're going to let her go. Right, so my trees had been released between 12.15 and 12.30 a.m., and all she had on her was her license and her car keys. No phone, no money, and her car was 14 miles away at an impound yard. So she really was kind of helplessly just cast into the night. I don't understand it. Yeah, there was, there was no offer of a lift any place. Why not at least call a taxi or something? Why not? Well, the Santa Monica Mountains would have been an exhausting walk even in the middle of the day. At night, it's an extremely daunting and dangerous hike, made all the more impossible by the fact that Maitrice had no idea where she was, and she was quite possibly suffering from mental issues. She was over 40 miles from her home, remember, and had no cell phone. So that morning, Latisse is very distressed to hear that her daughter was sent out into the night alone in an unfamiliar, isolated area. She called everyone she could think of to find out if anyone had seen Matrice. Latisse called the sheriff's station back just 15 minutes later. She wanted to file a missing persons report right away. She asked how long she had to wait until she could do that. And she was told that they usually advise waiting 24 hours unless there are extenuating circumstances. Latisse told the deputy that she was very concerned about her daughter's mental state. She was afraid that Maitrice was very depressed and in an area she didn't know well. Now this deputy that she talked to really kind of put her off. He said, well, give me a couple hours to look around, make sure she's not asleep in the waiting area or something. We'll get back to you very kind of casual and dismissive of her concerns, which would make you even more nuts talking to someone like that. Yeah, almost a condescending type of attitude, you know? Yeah, it was. Very dismissive. So at 6.30 in the morning, the sheriff's station got a call from Bill Smith, who is a retired reporter living off Cold Canyon Road in Montanito. Montanito is about six miles from the Hills Station. Rugged land, a lot of ranches, hiking trails, 
And again, not a place that you want to be walking around much in, no, particularly right. at night. Right, exactly. Bill Smith reported seeing a slim black woman with Afro hair in his backyard. She was sitting in a reclined position on the back steps of his home. He said that he opened his window and asked the woman if she was okay. She answered that she was just resting. So Bill took another look out the window a few minutes later, and the woman was gone. The station sent out a deputy to that area, but they didn't see my trees, and they left without investigating any further. So they didn't even, like, go to the houses nearby and ask if they'd seen anything. They really didn't do anything to investigate this except talk to Bill and look in the backyard. Yep, my trees is gone, so our job's done. And I wonder if they were even making the connection at that point. Kind of seems like they weren't. Well, maybe. Although, why why did they go out there if they weren't making a connection? Well, I think they were looking at this person as a possible prowler. And I think there may have been some racism there. It was a black woman in his yard. And I hate to say it, but that's the way the world is, and it's possible. But I don't think he was calling out of concern for her necessarily, Dick. I mean, that's a nice thought, but... Oh, the, the guy. The no, he, no, he's just saying there's some strange person. Right, so they're kind of yard. looking at, like, a prowler. Someone who's where they shouldn't be, not someone they're concerned about. Well, okay, I'll give you that. You agree with that? I mean, Not totally. I still think that they were going out there because they, they know they had released a young black woman at midnight, or after midnight. And now this guy says, there's a black lady in my yard. So they went out to investigate. Because I, I think they thought, well, maybe that's the same person. Sure. I mean, I think that's possible, and I hope so. But I think if that was the case, why wouldn't they have done a search of the area or gone and knocked on some doors if they're really looking and concerned about her? Because they're not that concerned. Yeah, right, exactly. So Latisse showed up at the Lost Hills station to file a missing persons report, and she was told about the call from Montanito. So she immediately left the station and went out there. Once she reached the area, she was very alarmed because this area was so rugged that she found it hard to believe that Maitrice had even gotten there on foot. She considered the possibility that someone may have picked her up and driven her to Montanito. Because there were large distances of land between the homes, and it would have been extremely dark out there at night, Latisse just couldn't believe that Maitrice would have gotten there. And the problem was, if she was having a mental crisis at the time, we can't really judge her actions based on her normal behavior. But still, it seemed more likely to her that someone had picked Maitrice up and driven her out there. Well, knowing her daughter's usual behavior, yeah, she wouldn't have walked. Right. But the confounding thing is her possible mental illness or whatever was going on with her. Right, right. So the first official search for Maitrice didn't happen until 48 hours after she was reported missing. And this is confirmed by her family. It's believed that part of the delay came from jurisdictional issues. Because Maitrice was a Los Angeles resident, the LAPD Missing Persons Unit had to be brought in to handle the search. Yeah, a tracking dog was brought to Bill Smith's house and did pick up Maitrice's scent, but the scent was lost before any sign of Maitrice was found. Malibu's search and rescue found footprints in the dirt that matched the tread pattern of Maitrice's shoes. The prints appeared to go from walking to running, which is concerning, but then they ended on the shoulder of the road. Other marks were mixed in with Maitrice's footprints, including horseshoe prints. There was no way to tell, though, if Maitrice had interacted with anyone. The searchers didn't hike into Dark Canyon at that point, which was near Bill Smith's home. The search lasted for eight hours before it was called off before nightfall. Four days later, the case was then transferred from the missing persons unit to the LAPD's Robbery Homicide Division. An LAPD spokesman told the media that they had no reason to believe that Maitrice had been killed but that the switch was made because the Robbery Homicide Division had more resources and more officers to work on the case. So Maitrice's car was examined for clues. LAPD detectives quickly found Maitrice's phone and wallet inside, which is really strange because the deputies had failed to find either on September 16th at the restaurant. And her debit card was there in her wallet, and she had over $2,000 in her bank account. 
so she actually could have paid her bill no problem if they had found her wallet. Or she had said, my wallet's in my car. She did say her wallet was in the car. But they searched it and only found the marijuana and the driver's license. Really? Yeah. We sure? We're sure. Okay. Yeah, that's how they found the marijuana and her license and said her car was a mess. Then they had it impounded. But the wallet was actually there, and it didn't take long for the detectives to find it. Well, it must have been a very cursory search. Exactly. So the LAPD officers also found some journals in the car, apparently written by Matrice. And these journals indicated that she had probably not slept in two or three days. Based on her rambling, nonsensical writing in the journals, a psychologist associated with the LAPD speculated that Maitrese may have been having mental problems, quite possibly manic depression or bipolar. Right. By this time, the media was made aware of Maitrese's disappearance. People questioned why she wasn't given a ride to her car, which I think is a good question. It was brought up more than once that Mel Gibson had been given a ride to his car when he was arrested three years earlier for a DUI and was held at the Lost Hills Station. So do we have different treatment for celebrities and white guys than we do for regular black women? Well, apparently. Seems well, that way. This three years apart from that, so maybe policies have changed in that time. <laughs> You're so kind. I'm just saying. Well, I guess so. But I think we all know that celebrities are treated differently than the rest of us. Oh, they are. Mitrice's neglectful treatment was really considered to be possibly racially motivated. Her family had concerns that she may have been harmed by a deputy, too. And this came up after the police became evasive with Maitrice's family. They actually withheld some video recordings of Maitrice the night she was arrested. Why don't we take a short break here for our sponsor, Madison Reed. Madison Reed. For me, it's the only way to get high-quality, natural-looking hair color without leaving home. You can really take coloring your hair to the next level with Madison Reed. Madison Reed gives us gorgeous professional hair color delivered to our doors for less than $25. Madison Reed really is one of a kind because it's multidimensional with your choice of over 45 multitonal shades that have been developed by master colorists. And Madison Reed colorists really know how to blend nuances of cool, warm, light, and dark that make your hair truly beautiful. Many of our listeners have written to me to tell me how Madison Reed hair color has improved their lives, and I'm totally on board with that. Madison Reed delivers gray coverage and natural-looking hair color to my door when I want it. Now I'm free from the long, expensive salon visits while my hair looks and feels better than ever. It's soft and healthy, and I have one less thing in life to worry about. I'm always happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. It's affordable, it's convenient, and it's super high quality. We're very busy women, so don't we deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered to our doors on our schedule for less than $25? Of course we do. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. True Crime Brewery listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit by using our code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY at madison-reed.com. Maitrice's family was requesting the sheriff's surveillance footage and reports from the night Maitrice was arrested be released. The department refused to release the records, saying they had to follow a certain protocol. The family was told that the video surveillance cameras did not record and they were for monitoring use only. Then in an interview with the Malibu Surfside News, a representative from the sheriff's department said there was no video or tape of any kind. Now, this is proven to be untrue. I mean, the Sheriff's Department is doing their best to block things. Which is suspicious. It does cast a suspicious light on you. If you don't do anything wrong, there's no reason to do that. Well, it's protocol. Yeah, but it really wasn't. So on September 20th, four days after her arrest and disappearance, the deputy who decided not to cite and release her at the restaurant was interviewed, and he was interviewed by a lieutenant about his decision. The deputy explained that he had decided to hard book her because he wanted to make sure she was all right. So this deputy described her as being a little ditzy at Jeffrey's restaurant. And although she wasn't drunk, he felt like she was acting unusual and that had made him uneasy. 
Yeah, but he didn't put that in his report. Right, I know. He described his decision to transport her to the station as being based on instinct, and further stated that back at the station he found her to be well-educated, intelligent, and articulate, and he just couldn't justify holding her overnight. Despite the arresting deputy's concerns for Mitrice's well-being, little or no investigation was conducted at the scene. She had displayed bizarre behavior around multiple restaurant employees, but none of them were interviewed at the time. Now, it's known that law enforcement may properly cite and release a person who's failed to pay a restaurant bill, allowing the criminal justice system to resolve the matter without taking the person charged into custody. But once that decision was made to take Mitrice into custody and separate her from her car and her cell phone, then a more thorough investigation, such as speaking to restaurant staff, beyond the manager, should have been done. Now, I totally agree. But I'm really not on board with her being sent back to her car and off into the night at all. So I really feel like from the restaurant, she probably should have been detained and taken in for a psychiatric evaluation at a hospital. She should have been. So even though I don't like the way they released her from the station, I don't think the solution here was to just let her go from the restaurant either. I don't think that would have been proper. If they'd done that and she'd gotten in an accident or killed herself or someone, they would have been responsible for that in my mind. That would have been negligent as well. No, I mean, I think the restaurant did the right thing. They called the police with the impression that she would get the help she needed. Exactly. That's the problem is that I don't think they realized that the police weren't going to give her help. She didn't need to be treated like a criminal. So... The family was upset and trying to find out why Mitrice was released when it seems like she was clearly suffering from some mental issues and her behavior was obviously abnormal. But the sheriff's department denied having any knowledge of Mitrice behaving oddly or appearing to have any mental issues, and that's despite what the deputy had said. But later, an email was discovered from a Lost Hills lieutenant to a Lost Hills captain where the lieutenant explained that Mitrice was actually acting unusual, and arresting officers were very uneasy about releasing her that night. The arresting officers would later deny, though, that this was true. They also claimed that the field sobriety test given to Mitrice had nothing to do with her behavior at the time. The spokesman, Steve Whitmore, later claimed that Mitrice appeared to be entirely aware of her surroundings and she did not seem confused. So this is very conflicting. We're not getting a straight story, that's for sure. Well, I I think you have to stick to the story that she seemed okay. That's why she was released. Right, but we know it's not true. We do. Yeah. But but they really, they can't say that because then they leave themselves open to failure to do their duty, basically. Well, sure. I see that they're seeing it that way, but this is not the right way to do things. No, it's not. No, of course not. So with all of these conflicting statements and this tension growing between Mitrice's family and law enforcement, Latisse hired a civil rights attorney. The attorney held a press conference at the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station, and really not many people showed up. He claimed that if Mitrice was white, or he said had a name like Spears or Lohan, I guess just referring to if she'd been a famous person. There's no way that the sheriff's department would have let her walk out of the station alone in the middle of the night with no transportation. And unfortunately, that's probably very true. You know it. Days later, the sheriff's department did release the paperwork from Mitrice's arrest, but none of it said anything about her being mentally incapacitated or acting strangely. Then over the next several months, Mitrice's family and friends canvassed the surrounding areas and distributed flyers in attempts to find Mitrice. Four months after Mitrice's disappearance, there is a meeting between Mitrice's mother, Latisse, her Aunt Lauren, Sheriff Baca, and Police Captain Martin. At the meeting, Lauren again asked about surveillance footage. Captain Martin admitted at this meeting that there is surveillance footage. He said that his earlier denials were because the family had requested footage from outside the building, but the footage they had was from inside the building. So that's the kind of answer you'd get from a fourth grader who's trying not to get into trouble. Yeah, well, Lutis saw it as a blatant attempt at a cover-up. Sure. 
But good old Steve Whitmore, the spokesperson, claimed that nothing had been done to hide information from Mitrice's family. The video showed Mitrice acting fidgety and rocking back and forth near a booking desk after she arrived at the station. At 10.49 p.m., she was sitting in a swivel chair next to a jailer who was working at her desk. For about 10 minutes, Mitrice swiveled from side to side just staring at the wall, appearing unengaged from what was going on. Afterwards, when Mitrice was put into a cell, she spent several minutes lying down on the concrete bench before she paced in the cell and stood at the cell window appearing to pull at the metal bars. Mitrice was never told that her mom called the station wanting to pick her up if she was released, so the deputy who spoke to Latisse on the phone never communicated with the jailer who processed Mitrice. If someone had just called Latisse and said, we're going to release your daughter, she would have come out and picked her up. That wouldn't have been an issue for her. Right, she would have. She had already told him, if I need to, I'll come get her tonight. Exactly. But nobody called her. No, there was no communication. So then at 11.53 p.m., Mitrice was released from her cell, and her personal property was returned to her. The jailer asked her if someone was picking her up. Then when Mitrice explained that she was unable to reach anybody, the jailer offered her the option of either staying at the station until daylight or being released. At first, Mitrice agreed to stay, but then she changed her mind and said she wanted to leave. So at 11.54, she left through the back door, escorted to the door by the jailer. The video also showed a Lost Hills deputy leaving the station a couple minutes after Mitrice. And this was Deputy Ismail Rodriguez. Deputy Rodriguez didn't have an alibi for where he was that night after he left the station. But at the same time, there is also no evidence to indicate that he did anything to Mitrice. Still, Mitrice's family would wonder if he could have given Mitrice a ride, or at least seen something. Right, because what if he was an okay guy and did give her a ride, and she has to be dropped off somewhere, and then she ended up missing? Maybe he would be afraid to admit that he gave her a ride. I can see that. Yeah. But it would be helpful to know if he'd given her a ride, where did he drop her off? Well, sure, the right thing to do would be to say, I gave her a ride to this place but then he would certainly become a suspect. Because it was early morning, daylight or daybreak, when she was found at that guy's house. Exactly. Well, on January 9th of 2010, they still hadn't found her, and the authorities worked with search and rescue teams, as well as volunteers, to search for Mitrice. And this search had over 200 people involved. The search included dogs, ATVs, and even some helicopters, I think two helicopters. But despite the scope of the search, which covered over 10 miles, no evidence of Mitrice was found. And by now, Latisse, she's a realist, and she believes her daughter probably is dead. And statistically, she probably was. Well, it's, what, four months, just about? Yeah, it's been a while. Michael was really holding out hope, though, that Mitrice was still alive. So he was in Las Vegas, and he made a report of seeing Mitrice. He alleged that she appeared to be working there as a sex worker. He thought that maybe she had been recruited by someone at her dancing job. Michael said he called out her name and ran after her, but she took off into a crowd of people, and he lost her. The LAPD went out to Las Vegas to look for Mitrice after getting over 75 reports of people seeing her in that area. But despite all these reported sightings, the police didn't find her. There was some kind of convention there of law enforcement. And I think it was a lot of them who made these reports. Yeah, but nothing came of it. No, this was a dead end. Then on June 5th and 6th, 2010, Maurice Dubois, who was the father of murdered teenager Amber Dubois, helped to organize another search. And his search team discovered graffiti displaying racist images of nude African-American women. This was a freshly painted mural and whoever had painted it left their supplies behind. So some people, and that's including Mitrice's family members, believe that the mural was left there on purpose for the search team to see. Now, the search had been publicized, so a lot of people knew about it. Mitrice's family wondered if whoever had painted it had some knowledge of what had happened to Mitrice. But the LAPD did not see any connection between the mural and Mitrice's disappearance, 
and they had the mural painted over. So I guess they did get a hold of at least one of the people who had painted it and kind of ruled them out as having any involvement. But it certainly wasn't enough to satisfy Mitrice's family. Look at it from their standpoint. They're frustrated with all their dealings with the police. Sure. And then they're thinking there's probably a connection, and they're told, nah, no connection. I'm not going to believe them. It was very dismissive. I mean, they were very dismissive of this family. Then in August 2010, two park rangers discovered human remains in Dark Canyon. This is a steep canyon, uh, and it's difficult, well, actually almost impossible, to move through. The only people who normally go into the canyon are people growing marijuana and people illegally dumping trash. So on that particular day, the rangers were checking on an illegal marijuana growing operation that had been shut down a few months earlier. So they're they're checking it over to see if there's any signs it's coming back. So they're climbing into a canyon, and they discovered a skull with dark curly hair attached. And nearby they found some women's clothing. So they left and immediately called the sheriff's department. And it took about 80 minutes for the first deputy to arrive at the scene. Now, I don't know if that's because they didn't hurry or if it's because it really takes that long to get in there, which I think is the case. I think so. Yeah. Now, California state law, though, requires law enforcement to notify the coroner's office immediately when human remains are discovered. But the coroner was not contacted until nearly an hour and a half after that first deputy arrived. So there was the 80 minutes until the deputy arrived and then another hour and a half before the coroner's even aware of this. A seven-person team from the coroner's office arrived at the canyon, but it was deemed unsafe for them to descend into the canyon on foot. So they were sent back to the Lost Hills Station with the understanding that they would be picked up and airlifted into the canyon. But hours passed as the coroner's team waited. Chief Coroner Edward Winter was heading up this team, and he was asked directly if it would be easier for law enforcement to airlift the remains to him. Winter would later state that he specifically told the investigators not to move the body. But that's what happened. Officers who responded to the scene didn't follow protocol, and they never treated the site as a potential crime scene. Against the coroner's orders and the California state law, Mitrice's body was bagged and airlifted from the site at about 8 p.m. that evening. Yeah, so why were detectives airlifted to the scene, but not the coroner's team? And why'd they move the body without permission? Two important questions. Sure. These questions brought about a lot of speculation from Mitrice's family. Uh, Again, they've had nothing but grief in their relationship with the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department had unlimited access to the scene and the remains without any oversight for over six hours. Now, if you're already thinking there's a cover-up, this only fueled more suspicions. It does, because why don't they just get their act together and do things right? Well, why don't they follow state law? Exactly. And I can see why you would have no trust in them anyway. And just as being an African-American there would be trouble trusting these deputies. But then, after all this happens, I wouldn't trust them at all. No, I wouldn't have... No faith. Any faith in them at all. No. The remains would eventually be identified as Mitrice. The spot where her naked, mummified remains were found is actually adjacent to a 21-acre ranch that was known for producing pornography. It was an area extremely difficult to approach on foot, so it was really difficult to believe that Mitrice could have even gotten there on her own. It was very disturbing that her head had been detached from her body and positioned upside down. Also, there was no reasonable explanation for her body being mummified. That's very unlikely for a body left out in the elements for 11 months. Well, yeah, you got to be basically in an environment that's free of oxygen. So mm-hmm. away somewhere. Away somewhere, wrapped up. I can't believe that if it had been just dumping a body for a length of time, that it would have been mummified. Well, and if she fell into the canyon and died, it wouldn't make any sense. No. There's got to be signs of trauma. There's got to be critters eating the remains, scattering bones. There's a lot of things that would happen. 
Right. So the the idea was certainly to me plausible that she'd been placed somewhere else and then taken into that canyon. So the coroner's office had lost their opportunity to take pictures of the scene or to examine the position of the remains. On August 14th, a report written and released by an independent review board exonerated the sheriff's office, though, of any wrongdoing. The coroner's report provided very few answers. According to the medical examiner, there was no sign of physical violence. The cause of death was ruled to be undetermined. But it was very strange that Mitrice's body was found nude. Law enforcement came up with some unlikely explanations, though, for the condition of her body and her clothing. Some of them just outlandish, really. Now, her right leg, which was covered in soil uh, and growing weeds, was about six feet up the canyon from her body. The femur of the leg, that's the long bone, the upper bone, had been removed from the soft tissue, as if it had been pulled from the top of the thigh. And there was nothing but a narrow canal where the bone should have been. But the leg showed no signs of having been ravaged by animals. And in any event, animals would drag something that large downhill rather than uphill. One of the uh, nearby owners of a horse property said, We buried a sheep here a while back. Coyotes and vultures dug it up and picked it clean within days. And if they missed anything, the bugs and rodents finished it off. So So there you go. There you go. Lieutenant Michael Rawson supervised the investigators for the Sheriff's Department. And in October of 2010... Two months after the remains were airlifted, he did meet with Latisse and Sheriff Baca to discuss the case. Rawson said that deputies were given permission from a coroner's staffer, Chief Coroner Winter, to move the skull and assess what was underneath and in the soil and brush. But that's not what the coroner would say. Rawson's supervisor, Captain David Smith, agreed and added that when the skull was lifted, much of her body came up with it. But Rawson and Smith's story really doesn't go along with the photos that the sheriff's office took. Mitrice's skull was completely detached from her neck, and it rested upside down on her upper torso. And the mandible, the jawbone, was detached from her skull. Five neck bones weren't even recovered that day. For the entire skeleton to come up out of the ground intact with pulling on the skull, as Rawson and Smith claimed, would be impossible without those bones being there. Well, yeah, I mean, the head's detached from the body. Right. So if you pull up the skull, that's all you pull up. Exactly. So I don't know why they were even saying this. But the sheriff's department didn't say whether Lieutenant Rawson or Captain Smith were actually there in Dark Canyon to witness the airlift. So they might not have even seen it. So to rule causes of death out, you'd think that you need to be open to all possibilities. But the sheriff's department seemed determined to deny that Mitrice's death had been the result of a crime. Lieutenant Rawson and others suggested the possibility of anaphylactic shock from poison ivy as one potential cause. Well, maybe one in a million. That's very rare, isn't it? They also suggested that Mitrice wandered in a dark canyon and became one of the two people who die each year in California from rattlesnake bites. That doesn't explain why she was naked. No, that's a whole other story, isn't it? It is. For reasons for Mitrice's body being nude, Rawson suggested that animals removed her clothing, which is laughable. Only her jeans, belt, and bra were actually recovered. For these to be located where they were, animals would have to take off Mitrice's sneakers and socks, unbuckle her belt, slide it out of the loops on her jeans, unzip and pull off her jeans, and then remove her underwear. The animals would have had to unfasten her bra and move it out from under her. Next, they'd have to have dragged her detached right leg uphill by the thigh and positioned it on top of a cluster of brush before pulling out her femur bone. They'd have had to have carried the jeans and bra 500 feet and 600 feet down the canyon, drop them in the creek, and carry the belt another 100 feet downstream to hang it on the cluster of vines where it was found. So this is all very difficult to imagine. More than difficult. Nearly impossible. Well, forensic scientist Clea Koff, who had been hired by Latisse, noted the absurdity in the suggestion that this is all done by animals. She also noted that the genes and belt showed no significant damage from animals or the elements. So in other words, 
Kauf questioned if they had actually been exposed to the elements for those 11 months. Sure didn't seem like it. If the animals didn't remove the clothing, Captain Smith said in October 2010 in the meeting, then rushing water was responsible for that. And in that scenario, the water would have needed to rise 60 feet above the top of the creek bed and push her body in the opposite direction of the current to leave it where it was found. Then there's the mystery of the mummification. Why, after 11 months outdoors, was her body partially mummified and not fully decomposed? Natural mummification, a state of preservation that actually renders the flesh like leather, is normally the result of immediate and continued post-mortem exposure to either a very cold or extremely dry environment. So it wouldn't be impossible for a body to partially mummify in the elements, but her state of semi-decomposition really doesn't make sense. Not at all. And then Kliakoff also made note of the fact that Mitrice's teeth had a pink tint to them. This could be a sign of strangulation, which is due to hemorrhaging into the pulp chambers of the teeth. That's the area of the tooth root with the blood and nerves. And also not all of Mitrice's neck bones were recovered, which includes the hyoid bone. And we all know from our other cases that the hyoid bone, if broken, can suggest strangulation. But it was never recovered. Right. So you're in the dark about that. Yeah, so to cough, there were just too many unanswered questions to decide that Mitrice wasn't murdered, which is what the law enforcement seemed to want to do. Usually the default in an unsolved death like this would be to consider it a homicide until it's proven otherwise. Since there was no testing for fibers or hairs on Mitrice's body or clothing, there's no way to know if she was with someone else that night. The way her remains and the scene were handled is just obviously incompetent and careless. Whether that was on purpose or some kind of cover-up, we just don't know. But at the very least, I'd say that the uh, sheriff's department was disinterested in what happened to Mitrice and decided to treat it as an accident and just wanted to move on. Well, yes. Yeah. So is there anything else in the way she was found that you found was odd? Well, her left arm was found flexed with her hand to her chest. Uh, There's nothing there that would hold her arm in that position. It's like it's actually defying gravity. To the uh, medical examiner cough, that position could mean that her arm had been held in place, possibly by a sheet or other wrapping in a different environment while mummification set in. So in other words, she could have been killed somewhere else and dumped there. That's what we're really getting at here. I think you have to take that as probable. Probable. Okay. That's a strong word. I thought you'd say maybe. Possibly. No, but you actually just, think that's probable. I don't see any other way for mummification to have set in if she'd been there that whole time. It just couldn't happen. No, it really seems as if she was disposed of and her clothes were disposed of. Right. But Sheriff Baca disagreed. Of course he did. And after Rangers found Mitrice's naked, semi-decomposed body, he said in a press conference... We have no indication of a homicide at this point. I don't believe that the remains are capable of telling us a story. You know, they just wanted to move on from this so much, didn't they? They wanted well, nothing to do with this case. Once once they started out with their story, that she was released and that's all there is to it, they really couldn't do anything else. They could do the right thing. What do you mean they couldn't? For them, they couldn't. Yeah, I know they could do the right thing, but... Be realistic. They've already placed their bets on this one thing, and they can't go back and change it. Well, Latisse did visit the spot where Mitrice's remains were recovered in Dark Canyon. Her sister-in-law, a friend, and Clea Koff went too. All of them had to use climbing harnesses, ropes, and wore helmets, as Sheriff's Department search and rescue experts led them there. And as they were making a small memorial at the site, they found one of Mitrice's finger bones in the dirt there. That is so upsetting for me to even imagine that. Can you imagine? I mean, not only seeing the incompetence of how your daughter's sight was treated, but then to have to see one of your daughter's bones there. I just can't imagine. What this mother went through is just hell. Latisse has been plagued by guilt for not driving right over to the Lost Hills station once she heard about the arrest and she ended up having severe anxiety and depression. 
Early on, Latisse stated publicly that she thought deputies might have been involved in Mitrice's disappearance. Now she's not sure of that, but she is convinced that Mitrice was murdered by someone. She knows that her daughter was a city girl and that she wouldn't hike into a place like Dark Canyon. And she believes even in her mental state, it's just not something she would have done. She believes that Mitrice was possibly raped, killed, and eventually dumped at that site where her body was found. So you're kind of on board with that same scenario as her mother. Well, yeah, I I think she was abducted and killed someplace and then eventually dumped in the canyon. And not necessarily by anyone that had anything to do with the deputies or with the sheriff's office. Right. But they were clearly negligent and incompetent. They were. On December 29, 2010, Latisse met once again with Sheriff Baca to submit a request. Based on what she'd learned from forensic anthropologist Clea Koff about the handling of the remains, she wanted Mitrice's body to be exhumed and re-examined. Baca at that time seemed to reconsider Mitrice's cause of death. Removal of trousers and even her undergarments in the belt are not acts of nature, he said. I've always felt that it should have been treated from the offset as a possible homicide. When you say it's not a murder, you better know what you're talking about, and I don't think we've been able to conclude that. Well, that's a little bit of a turnaround, isn't it? It is, right? He claimed to have contacted the FBI and gotten approval for an exhumation, but this turned out to be untrue. The FBI didn't get involved at that point. So I kind of feel like he was just trying to placate people with that statement because he made up things just to make the family feel better at that moment. It wasn't the truth. Exactly. So in July, July 13th, 2011, after six months of pressuring the coroner's office, Mitrice's body was exhumed. The exam was done by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department's own crime lab, which Latisse didn't think was ideal. She would rather have had it done by a third party, the FBI. But the FBI refused to get involved, so this was the best she could get. Well, she could have had her own pathologist stand in at the same time. She could have, which probably would have cost money. Right. Right. But the coroner came to the same conclusion. It was an undetermined cause of death with no signs of homicide. Latisse and Michael separately filed civil lawsuits against the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. And during the pretrial depositions, we found out a lot. It was revealed that several deputies were aware that Mitrice was suffering from some sort of mental crisis at the time of her arrest. And if protocol had been followed, Mitrice would have been taken to a hospital and evaluated with a 72-hour admission. So, I think that the civil lawsuit was a lot more about getting some answers than getting money. Yeah, but they didn't get answers. No, but they did find out that a lot of the deputies were concerned about her, even though they didn't write it down on paper. Correct. In August of 2011, Latisse and Michael settled with the Sheriff's Department and received $450,000 each. But as part of the settlement, the Sheriff's Department did not admit to any wrongdoing on their part. Then the family contacted the California Attorney General's office to review the Sheriff's Department handling of Mitrice's case. They sent over 500 pages of documents to support their concerns. Kamala Harris, who's presently running for President of the U.S., was the Attorney General at the time. She responded with a letter that said they found no grounds for criminal charges against the deputies or the Sheriff. Yeah, so that was a disappointment for Latisse and Michael. Still, the Los Angeles Sheriff Department was getting a lot of negative publicity in the press. Apparently, in defiance of this negative press, Sheriff Lee Baca was given the 2013 Sheriff of the Year Award. But several months later, 18 deputies were indicted for assaulting detainees at the Men's Central Jail. Sheriff Baca pleaded ignorance. In January of 2014, Baca resigned. By early 2016, the Attorney General's office changed their position, though, and began a criminal investigation in connection with Mitrice's case. After one year, it was determined that there was insufficient evidence to support a criminal prosecution. 
for the destruction, alternation, or concealment of evidence. But even if they found evidence, nothing criminal could have been prosecuted because the statute of limitations was up in 2014. Only one person related to this case ever faced charges, and that was Sheriff Lee Baca. He was sentenced to three years in federal prison for his role in a scheme to obstruct an FBI investigation of the abuses in the county jails. Yeah, but there's nothing that punished him for his handling of Mitrice's case. No, nothing specific to Mitrice. Well, totally separate, yes, but it's abuses in county jails, so in that way, I feel it's, it's an adjacent topic. Adjacent's a good word. Yeah. Baca, who was suffering from the early stages of Alzheimer's, showed no emotion as his sentence was read. After serving his time behind bars, Baca was also ordered to spend one year under supervised release and was fined $7,500. Michael Richardson continues to believe that someone knows what happened to his daughter, and he denies that Mitrice ever suffered from a mental illness. Well, okay. Certainly, I mean, somebody does know what happened to his daughter. That's the easy part of that, of So course. you're convinced it wasn't an accident then? No. Okay. Um, so someone would have to know because s- someone killed her. Someone killed her. Now, denying that she suffered from mental illness, how much time did he actually spend with his daughter? Well, this guy's questionable. I'm, I'm yeah. sure he loved his daughter, and I don't want to speak negatively about him. But he had his opinions, and I don't think he knew his daughter as well as Latisse did. Or even Mildred. Mildred was very close to her. Right. Yeah, so I I think he's just trying to put the best possible spin on things. Uh, Yeah, my my daughter wasn't mentally ill. Sure. And he loves her, and I can see that. And she was very successful in life in many ways. So who wants her to be remembered as being mentally ill? I I mean, I see where he's coming from. Yeah. Now, the possibilities for what happened to my trees does do include an accident. Now, in this scenario, and I think you have to kind of suspend belief a little bit. Okay. Like going to the movies or something. Suspend disbelief. In this scenario, she's confused and disoriented when she entered the canyon, undressed herself, and died of an unknown cause. Now, due to her state of mind and the terrible, dangerous area where she was found, that's certainly possible. But you don't think so. Well, no. There's questions. Sure. Look at the scene where her body was found. Considering the rough terrain and steepness of the canyon, she could have fallen and been severely injured or even killed. But then how did her clothing get removed? We've already determined that it wasn't by animals. No, animals aren't that dexterous. No. Maybe she stripped the clothes off if she wasn't in her right mind. But then some of her clothing was missing, including shoes, socks, shirts, and underwear. Maybe animals could have taken the clothing away after Matrice had taken them off her body. But it seems odd that they would have taken clothing away and done nothing to the body itself. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. And that just brings me back to the farmer who buried a sheep out there and what had happened to the sheep. Yeah. And And that was a buried animal. And that was buried. Right. It wasn't just lying there in the open. Exactly. Matrice's death also could have been ruled a homicide, a crime of opportunity by someone who offered her a ride, then later murdered her, or by someone she came across near Dark Canyon and murdered her. So, because remember, it was next door to an illegal marijuana growing site. Yeah, so it's possible that Mitrice came across someone doing something illegal, and she was killed to keep her from talking. She could have come across some bad people in that area. She could have, but again, then you just left out in the open, and that doesn't go, or doesn't agree with the state of her body. Right. All the evidence points to her being abducted, murdered, and then disposed of at a later time in that area. Yes. Yes. I mean, I guess if you were feeling really charitable, you could say she was abducted and died somehow and was hidden for a while and then disposed of. So maybe not a murder necessarily. Oh, come on, though. I I know. I talked about suspending belief. Okay. So some believe that the handling of her case was negligent. Others believe that the investigation was an organized cover-up to conceal criminal acts by the sheriff's deputies, which may have caused Mitrice's death. Her life was just beginning, and she really brought joy to those who loved her. 
So her mother prefers to remember my Teresa as she was, not by what happened to her on her last night alive. The questions surrounding how Matrice ended up dead in Dark Canyon are probably just too much for a mother to handle. Who wants to even think about that? It's tragic to think that her death could have been avoided if the deputies had simply done the paperwork and taken her to a hospital for an evaluation. Or, you know, just even called her mother and kept her at the station until her mother got there. This isn't like extenuating circumstances. They wouldn't have to go so far out of their way to just help this woman correctly. Well, that's that's where it all started. Right. You know, they could have. So even if she was murdered by someone having nothing to do with them, they're still culpable for sending her out there in the night. Exactly. So one positive thing has happened since Matrice's death. In 2018, the Office of the Inspector General examined Mitrice's case and made some policy changes, not only at the Lost Hills Station, but at the department's central booking, processing, and release facility that's located in downtown Los Angeles. In March of 2018, a 23-page recommendation for safe release and protection of vulnerable prisoners was released. Yeah, I don't know if we'll ever know what happened to her. Probably sure. not, yeah. But there's no denying that the sheriff's department failed my trees and that they have some responsibility for her death. They do. I agree. So there are several sources of information on my Therese's case. Like I said, it's gotten a lot of publicity. There's a 2015 documentary available on Prime Video titled Lost Compassion. My Therese was also featured on Disappeared, Season 6, Episode 1, and that episode is titled Lost in the Dark. The LA Times and LA Magazine have each had a series of articles which include interviews with the sheriff's office and with Mitrice's family, and that's where we got a lot of information for this podcast. Before we move on to feedback, I'd like to share a quick update on Team Tie Grabber and our website rebuild. Can you do this without steam coming out of your ears? Yes, I can. I'm at peace with it that we're in the final stages and a lot of it's out of my hands. I'm a control freak. So this has been hard for me. Well, I don't think I'd label you as a control freak. No. No. I mean, you you like to do things a certain way. <laughs> but okay. That, that doesn't make you a control freak. So there have been some delays that are not of our doing, <laughs> to put it nicely, but it should be coming about. I'm hoping by the time this episode is out, things will be completed. But if they're not, they will be soon. And I just want to thank everyone for their patience. It's going to be worth it, I'm sure. It's going to be really worth it. We've been allowed to do some things with the new site, and it's it's going to be way better than the old one. It is. It's just a matter of when. I know. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, everyone, for your patience on that, and it's something to look forward to. Let's do our feedback segment now. Okay. This week, I have just one voicemail and uh, two or three emails. Great. So who's our voicemail from? This is from Bex. I'm thinking her name is Rebecca. Cool name. But Bex. And and Bex has a case suggestion and a beer suggestion. Hey, Dick and Jill. This is Bex, and I'm from New Hampshire. And I really enjoy your podcast. I discovered it and was great this spring for my commute, driving back and forth to school. And now that it's summer and school is not in session, I love listening to it at home. So I have a beer suggestion for you and a case suggestion. So my beer suggestion is actually not from New Hampshire. It's from Massachusetts, where I work and where I grew up. And my friend's husband actually worked for this brewery. It's from Wormtown Brewery in Worcester, Mass, and it's an IPA. It's called Don't Worry. Dick, if you haven't tried it, I would highly recommend it for the next time you do a Massachusetts case. And if you need help um, grabbing it, let me know and I'll help you out. So my case suggestion is from New Hampshire, and it is called um, in most uh, blog posts and most news articles, the Bear Brook case. So it is a case that took place in Allentown, New Hampshire, and um, in 1985, a 55-gallon industrial steel drum was discovered in Bear Brook State Park by a hunter. That contained two bodies, one of an adult female and one of a child, a girl. So investigators had a really hard time with this and weren't able to solve and even identify the people in the container. So 15 years later, in 2000, another almost identical container was discovered very close to the first container. The bodies 
and there were two young females, two children, and investigators thought that all four bodies were from about 1977 to 1985, they were fairly skeletonized. So investigators were still unable for many years to identify the victims or find possible perpetrators. But in just the last few years, uh, three of the four victims were identified thanks to all the progress in DNA in the last few years and a perpetrator. So if you haven't heard about this, I would highly recommend it. It's really fascinating, really thought-provoking. Thanks again for the great podcast, guys, and I'm looking forward to the next episode. So this is pretty cool. Yeah, thanks, Beth. This case. It's very fascinating. And it's a a lot of DNA stuff. They're doing mitochondrial DNA. They're doing white chromosome DNA. What they did come up with was that a guy named Terry Rasmussen, and he had multiple aliases, including Bob Evans. Anyway, his identity was confirmed via DNA from a son from his first marriage, and it also confirmed via DNA to be the father of the two- to four-year-old girl who was one of the victims. He's believed to be responsible for several other murders, including that of Denise Bowden, his girlfriend, who disappeared in 1981. Under the name of Evans, he was convicted and sentenced for the murder in 2002 of his then-wife, and he died in prison in 2010. So and it wasn't until this year that the three biologically related females were identified as mother, Marlis Elizabeth Honeychurch, and her two daughters from different fathers, Mary Elizabeth Vaughn and Sarah Lynn McWaters. They were last seen in 1978. And the other kid, the other body, identified as Rasmussen's daughter, remains unidentified. Just fascinating stuff if you're into DNA. Yeah, and I know you are, so that's interesting. So... We're thinking that all of these people he murdered were related to him in some way, people he was in relationships with. and Yes. Yeah. That is horrifying. Fascinating case. So I hope you can get more information on that. It sounds like something you'd like to talk more about. I definitely want to do that. Okay. And, and I'd also say to Bex that our son went to school in Worcester, Worcester Polytech, and we've been to Wormtown Brewing many times. And if we weren't there, we were at Armsby Abbey, two great beer places in Worcester. But Wormtown, good beers, good stuff, fun place to visit. I love Worcester. Yeah, he's all graduated, so... You don't get to go there anymore? Not anymore. No. Okay, I have an email from Karen. I recently heard a snippet about a case I've never heard of before and would love to learn how you two would present it. Jared Murray self-confessed murderer of his friend at college, was found not guilty by reason of insanity. This is the first time I've heard of this defense presented successfully. I hope you will consider this case as I find it worthy of further investigation. And then Karen included a YouTube link. I look forward to plowing through the rest of your episodes. I love being able to cherry pick. Thanks, Karen. So what do we know about this? Well, the quick stuff I looked up was that the, the guy who did the killing and was not guilty by reason of insanity, is a guy named Jared Murray. He suffers from delusions that he's the king of the world, and he believes he sees ghosts, but he was found not guilty by reasons of insanity. Well, it sounds like maybe he really was insane. Oh, he definitely is. But we say a lot of people are crazy, but they're still guilty. So what makes him not guilty? I have to check more into that. I'm Not sure of why or how the jury was swayed by his insanity suggestion. Right, because they'd have to be convinced that he didn't know he was doing anything wrong. Almost never occurs, right? Yep. Then we have another email from Lisa. And Lisa writes, I have a suggestion for a podcast for you. From the ones I've listened to, I don't think you've covered this case. It's a local case for me that actually involves a girl I went to school with and sat with at lunch for a short stint of time. Her name is Taylor Marks. She and her boyfriend paid someone to kill her mother. I think Snap did an episode on this case, though I have yet to watch it. I followed the case until they were convicted, but I haven't followed it since. I would love to hear you two cover this case and would be happy to provide any information I can. Well, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so this is the woman, Taylor Marks, who was convicted of aggravated murder of her mother. Her boyfriend... Brian Smith is awaiting trial, or maybe he's already stood trial, but he's charged with aggravated murder. 
and Troy Purdy avoided the death penalty, but he pled guilty to aggravated murder because he admitted to the stabbing during his final court hearing. So two of them have been tried and convicted and sentenced, and one more is ready to go. Huh. So they paid Troy Purdy, and Brian Smith was her boyfriend. Yes. Said, let's, let's get rid of mom. So Christy Marks is the victim who operated the Visiting Angels home health care business, and she was stabbed to death, which I always think is one of the worst ways to die. Well, it's pretty personal, isn't it? Personal, painful, gory. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. And Jennifer has a case suggestion and a beer suggestion. She does. Would love to hear you cover the Kansas City butcher, Bob Burdella. It's honestly the most disturbing crime I've ever heard. His story is so twisted, and I actually live on the same street he lived on. And if you cover a Kansas City crime, you need a good Kansas City beer. Boulevard is the famous one around here, and I suggest 80-acre or single-wide IPA. Kansas City Beer Company is another famous one. They make German beers, and their Heffa is really good and light. Thank you. You guys are awesome. I love the beer and true crime content, and I love hearing a physician's side of true crime. Thank you, Jennifer. So I know that we've had some Boulevard beers. Well, we've had a few Boulevard beers. They're quite famous, actually. Uh, we even get them out here in New Mexico. Okay. Pretty cool. This guy, Robert Burdella, is also known as the Kansas City Butcher and the Collector. And he apparently kidnapped, raped, tortured, and murdered at least six men between 1984 and 1987 in Kansas City. And he would hold these people sometimes for up to six weeks before killing them. That sounds awful. So he was charged for the first-degree murder of one of his victims in 1988, and he would later plead guilty to one further charge of first-degree and four charges of second-degree murder. So he got sent to prison, obviously. And in 1992, he died of a heart attack while in prison. So he was known as the Kansas City Butcher because of what he did to his victims' bodies, right? Right. We won't go into that at this point anyway. Right. So I guess there was a movie about this as well. So yeah, let's look into that. We're going to. We always like suggestions. We do. Thank you so much for your emails and your voicemails. Always is a nice way to end the show to hear from other people. Yes. Yeah. You know, especially this one, this show. It just got to me. This case of my trees? Yes. Yeah. Got to you in the way it was handled or? Oh, yeah. I mean, Jesus. Yeah, it was terrible. There were so many chances to do the right thing, and, and they didn't, and they tried to cover it up and lie about it. I hate that. I really hate lying. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Dick, and we'll be back next week with another episode of True Crime Brewery. So until then, we'll be at the quiet end. We'll be there. We'll see you there. Bye, Thank- guys. Goodbye. Goodbye.